Splatoon was the Wii U's lightning in a bottle, a miracle game on a dying console and an experience unlike anything else. It was a third-person shooter, but you were a squid now. Splatoon's multiplayer history and design has been explained, torn apart, and discussed countless times, and for good reason. The first game innovated the shooter genre in a way no one but Nintendo could have seen coming. But an interesting byproduct often overshadowed by the colorful multiplayer chaos is Splatoon's catalog of single-player campaigns. Splatoon 1, at launch, was fairly bare-bones, especially for a game with a $60 price tag, but one thing that was there from the very start was the first-ever rendition of Hero Mode. This mode, presented as side content to complement the game's versus multiplayer, took the game's inking and swimming mechanics and pushed them in an entirely new direction. Rather than battling in symmetrical arenas against a team of four, a player would be tasked with fighting and climbing their way through linear obstacle course style levels. These introduced a whole slew of new mechanics, ideas, and opportunities made possible only in this funny little game where you shoot the floor. Couple that with creative boss fights, interesting backstory, and some incredibly weird and weirdly incredible music, and you have split as of the time of this video, there are four Splatoon single-player experiences, one for each game, plus Splatoon 2's Octo Expansion. Each brings its own ideas to the table, its own twist on the formula, and its own evolutions that expand the idea of what a Splatoon game can be. Today we are not looking at the story in each game, that's for a different video. Instead, we are talking purely design, levels, structure, pacing, and flow. And while I'm trying to analyze these games objectively, I will certainly be throwing in some of my own opinions from time to time, especially regarding Splatoon 3, so be prepared for that. And in order to actually analyze these games, I'm going to introduce some common game theory principles when appropriate. This way we can see both how we can learn from the things Splatoon does right, and how we can look at the weaker aspects of the series with a critical lens to figure out what went wrong. How did Splatoon single player start off, and how has it gone to where it is today? Let's talk about it. Before Splatoon was single player, it was multiplayer. Following that trend, I'd like to first look at why Splatoon is even fun in the first place. So, for a game to be a game, there has to be an objective and there has to be an obstacle. There is a reward that can only be earned through a certain amount of risk. There is a push and pull between the game and the player that builds and releases tension. On his YouTube channel about game design, Masahiro Sakurai, creator of Kirby and Super Smash Bros, refers to this push and pull as game essence, the fun of managing risks and getting rewards. Strategy then, by his definition, is how the player manages risks in order to get rewards. He uses the example of Space Invaders, showing how risk can change player behavior, causing them to hide under cover, but also how players can intentionally put themselves at high risk in order to gain a high reward. The fundamental game essence of Splatoon is fairly clear. Swimming provides stealth and quick movement, but the inability to attack. It is a state of low risk, but also low reward. Shooting in kid form allows you to attack enemies and dig turf, but also slows your movement and reveals you to your enemies. High risk, but the potential for high reward. The ability to switch between these two states is what allows for player strategy, as it is up to you to decide how and when to approach any given situation. This simple concept gets exponentially more complicated when introducing all the variability of different weapon types, special enemies, different clear conditions, etc., but that core game essence is always present in some form. Even the game's map design follows this principle. Running into the enemy base puts you at a severe disadvantage. The enemy team has high ground, multiple options to approach your position, and likely a lot of their own ink to limit your movement. At the same time, splatting an enemy right as they come out of their spawn greatly benefits your team. The more time an enemy is stuck respawning, the less time they have to ink the ground, earn points, or engage with the objective. High risk, high reward. Now, typically, you aren't going to be right at your enemy's doorstep in their spawn the whole match, but by pushing forward with your team toward the enemy's spawn, all the while covering turf and splatting enemies, you're utilizing strategy to balance risks that might lead to a victory. And it goes even deeper than that. Splatoon's movement makes it something of a hybrid shooter and platformer. There's a high amount of risk when jumping over gaps or climbing walls, but speedy movement and tricks to outmaneuver opponents are your prize. All of this goes to say Splatoon balances several risks and rewards at the same time, which is why mastery of all its mechanics is so satisfying. Without this push and pull, this game essence, what is Splatoon? A game where you shoot the floor? With all of that out of the way, let's finally dive down the manhole and start talking about how Nintendo took this fundamental base for the game and turned it into a single player experience. Uh, uh, uh. 
back to where it all began. This was Splatoon's first chance to define itself. The series was brand new at the time, and there was no precedent for what a splatformer was. Well, what is it? How do you design a story mode for a game like Splatoon? First of all, I'd like to put aside the notion that this campaign is a glorified tutorial, because it is much, much more than that. I would actually argue that this is the most underrated campaign in the series, introducing a ton of the ideas that are now fundamental to the game's basic design. Now that they finally upped the production value a bit, people do seem to regard Splatoon 3's story mode as its own beast, but I still feel like people don't appreciate how much Splatoon 1 and 2 did to get us there. To be fair, it does start off simple. You get the bare minimum amount of exposition, and bam, you're shooting and swimming. The first hub area is extremely small and basic, featuring just three kettles, Splatoon's equivalent of a level entrance. Hop inside, and you have a linear obstacle course filled with enemies and platforming. These are separated into segments, each ending with a launch pad to fling you over to the next part of the level. It's simple, but it works extraordinarily well with the basic mechanics of the game, and lays the groundwork for a lot of creative ideas. To some extent, Splatoon's multiplayer game essence is retained here. Enemies won't shoot at you if you hide in your ink, but you often need to take them out in order to progress. The game allows for less risky play, but eventually forces you to confront the risk in order to move on. Platforming, on the other hand, is much more greatly emphasized here. These are proper Mario-style obstacle courses, and there are plenty of big jumps and tall climbs. Splatoon's fun is at its peak in these exciting, tense moments, taking down a wave of enemies or navigating a tricky platform. The campaign knows this, and every level is essentially built as a back-and-forth series of these two aspects of game essence. So, how do they keep it interesting? What changes from level to level? Well, exactly what you would think. New enemies to fight, and new mechanics for platforming. With such a solid foundation, all they really had to do was keep adding new ideas to insert into the formula. It is a little weird looking back at some of Splatoon 1's levels, because we kinda just take a lot of this stuff for granted at this point. Like, really? There's a whole level about octoballs? There's an octocopter level? Remember though, no one even knew what a squid person shooter was in 2015, so the introduction of these mechanics had to be more thoughtful. But don't start thinking that means the game's pacing is slow. On the contrary, Splatoon 1 is constantly throwing new stuff at you left and right to shoot or jump over or wait for it to jump and then shoot it or jump over it and then shoot the guy or... Basically, while Splatoon 1's mechanics may feel simple to us in hindsight, I think the devs were really smart to be careful with how they introduced new ideas, because there were a lot of them. And it's all thanks to this little thing called four-step level design. Nintendo is famous for this. Look at any 2D Mario or any of the linear 3D Marios like the Galaxies and 3D Land and World. There's a really good video by Mark Brown on Game Maker's toolkit about this exact topic that I highly recommend, but it basically comes down to this. Step 1. When you come up with a new thing for the player to do, show it to them in its simplest form. An ink rail going like 10 feet forward. Something like that. And depending on the difficulty of your game, you normally want to do this in a safe environment. Make a simple challenge where the player can't die, or at least make it low stakes so they don't lose a lot of progress. Let them figure it out. And then, step 2. Develop the idea. Experiment with the mechanic to figure out what makes it fun. Oh, you can jump between ink rails? Oh, I can jump out of ink rails and kill guys? Step 3. Spin a twist on the idea. Force the player to think about or use the mechanic in a different way. Maybe combine it with a previous mechanic, but keep the focus on the main level theme as to not make the design too busy and confusing. Step 4. The Exam Test the player's knowledge and skill with a final challenge that uses the mechanic. It doesn't have to be especially hard, but it should feel like a final hurrah that gets the most out of the feature. And that's it! The level ends, and you move on to another. This design philosophy can be seen everywhere once you start looking for it. Mario, Kirby, Celeste, even Zelda uses a similar method when giving the player a new dungeon item. Introduce, develop, twist, test. Splatoon 1 adheres to this design philosophy more than any Splatoon campaign after, and personally, I think that's for the best. These levels are concise and focused. You start, you learn, you go. Sometimes it's a mechanic that lets you move around the level in a way you couldn't before. Sometimes it's a new enemy that you have to tackle in a specific way. Whatever it is, you see it, you use it, you fight it, and it's over. This structure allows the game to throw idea after idea at you without it ever becoming overwhelming. You only have one thing to focus on at a time, so once you get comfortable with the basics, aka shooting and swimming, you can fly through levels with ease while still being engaged by all of the new gimmicks. This allows the player to achieve what is known in game design as a flow state. Flow is what happens when a player's abilities are perfectly matched with the degree of challenge they face in a game. When a player's game knowledge and mechanical skill align just right with the amount of danger the game is willing to throw their way. For me personally, Splatoon 1's Octo Valley is the best in the series at reaching this balance. The game achieves this laser focus through its simplicity and commitment to consistent level design that always finds new ways to surprise you. There's another element to these levels that I should mention as well. Secrets. 
Every stage has a sunken scroll hidden somewhere for the player to find and collect. These scrolls offer insight to the lore of the game's settings and characters, fleshing out the world nicely without being intrusive to the play experience. They're a nice little bonus, but are absolutely not necessary if all you want to do is speed through the game. I really do like them though, as they force you to keep your eyes peeled the whole time and lead to some unique interactions that have you engaged with the level in ways you might not have otherwise. Octo Valley stages are divided across five areas, each one bookended by a boss fight to bar progression and to amp up the difficulty. The game's progressive design is actually even easier to notice here. First up is the Octo Stomp, a massive sentient block that runs forward and tries to crush you. This fight, while incredibly basic, makes sure that the player understands the base mechanics so that they'll be ready for the levels to come. You have to ink the ground to quickly swim out of the way of the boss's attacks. Then you have to ink the side of the boss like a wall and climb on top. There, the boss's weak point is exposed, so you shoot it away. The following phases just make it more and more difficult to climb the wall, requiring more precise aim to ink it and faster movement so you don't get shaken off. The next three bosses similarly push the player's understanding of the game mechanics and ask them to combine shooting, platforming, inking, and bomb throwing. The four great octo weapons, as they are called, have a very simple backstory and contribute basically nothing to the game's plot, but they are all very solid designs with a clear difficulty curve that prepare the player for the rising expectations of the levels that come next. I would argue the octo nozzle and the octo whirl are the weakest of the group. The nozzle acquires more weak points to shoot with each phase, but its attacks don't really change in a meaningful way. And as for the octo whirl, while it does present a unique dynamic when compared to the basic enemies, I just think it's a little too simple for this point in the game. The Octo Maw, on the other hand, asks a lot of the player, forcing them to move fast, shoot well, and throw a bomb at just the right moment. It has a couple of really interesting attacks and is perfectly suited as the fourth boss. Last one up, the Big Bad, DJ Octavio in the original Octobot King. This is quite literally my favorite boss fight ever in a video game. An absolute gauntlet of shooting, swimming, and jumping that serves as a final test for practically every mechanic in the game in addition to a host of unique attacks. This is a fantastic finale, sending off the game with a fight to remember, set to the most iconic song in Splatoon history. To me, Octo Valley is a franchise-defining first attempt akin to many other Nintendo greats. It's short, it's simple, but it knows that, and it takes full advantage of its mechanics to create a concise, tightly designed experience. In a time before anyone knew how successful Splatoon would be, on a console with only a couple years left to live, Octo Valley proved just how special this game really was. Well, if that was so great, why not do it again? Octo Canyon, the direct sequel to the single player, attached to the direct sequel of the multiplayer. While I think Splatoon 1's story mode is underrated, this campaign is... well, it's not that bad. If anything, I think it gets too much hate for what it is. In many ways, Octo Canyon is a repeat of Octo Valley, but that's not entirely fair. Splatoon 2 brings many of its own ideas into the fray. For me, it's more an issue of execution. Off the bat, Octo Canyon will seem very... familiar. We have kettles strewn across a hub world, we have five hub worlds in total, you beat the levels, you beat the bosses, you beat the game. Is that a bad thing? Well, not necessarily, but there are a few problems. For one, this campaign starts off... slow. The story is revealed to be near identical to the first game, the beginning level only introduces one actual new mechanic, and it's the squid ring, so that barely counts. Yes, it lets you use a new Splatoon 2 special weapon, but there's not really any interesting design here, it's just... Here's a bigger gun, now kill those guys for 4 seconds. An issue that seems minor but is actually pretty annoying is the default rate of fire for the starting weapon. Every story mode besides Octo Expansion features a hero shot that can be upgraded for better fire rate and ink efficiency. Splatoon 2's hero shot starts off so bad though that it slows down the pace of the whole game. I understand wanting to do this for the sake of newer players to ease them into Splatoon's combat, but honestly this just makes it more difficult to play the game, and not in a way that's fun or challenging, just... Annoying. You're stuck with this thing for the first three levels and the first boss, making the start of the game just crawl. These levels are okay for introductory stages, dash tracks are a cool mechanic, that should be in multiplayer by the way, and the sponge level is worse than the Splatoon 1 sponge level, but hey, the Octo Oven is actually a pretty cool boss fight. While its visual theming is weird, it's a pretty nice evolution of the Octo Stomp formula from the first game that forces players to balance shooting and swimming to platform their way up to the top. Finally, we make it to Sector 2 and get to see the main selling point of Splatoon 2 single player over Splat 1. You can now use weapons other than the hero shot. Now, many players will lament the fact that the game forces you to use certain weapons on specific levels, but the game wants you to learn every weapon class, and I think it makes sense to have the player beat stages built with a certain weapon in mind on the first go. 
Admittedly, this does get annoying later on when you've already unlocked and used the weapon in question. This is especially weird when the game forces you to use the hero shot. Like, bro, half the point of the single player is using the new weapons. Let me use dualies. I want to use dualies, bro. The absolute worst case of this is the final boss. Like, really? You're gonna copy paste half the boss itself from the first game and not even let players use their favorite weapon to fight it the first time? Honestly, where the hero weapons really shine in my mind is navigating the hub areas. Being able to swap between all nine weapon classes at will is actually really cool and super underutilized. There are a couple of sections that actually feel like little puzzles that encourage you to swap between different weapons to take advantage of each of their strengths, but I don't think there's anywhere you're actually required to do this. It feels a little half-baked. This hub seems like it's trying to be more than just a level select, especially Sector 5, which is full of its own platforming segments and checkpoints. I personally really wish they took more advantage of the ability to swap weapons here, but unfortunately this hub ends up just feeling kinda tedious. The fact that there are now loading screens between sectors doesn't help either, especially when compared to the seamless overworld present in Splatoon 1, but we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves. What matters most is the level design, and honestly, there are a lot of really good examples. You got the first dually level, the Charger Zeppelin level with the cool speedrun skip, the giant bowling ball level, but we get a little bit further into the game and Splatoon 2 runs into a problem. I think what happened is the devs were having all this fun making new level gimmicks when all of a sudden Miyamoto burst into the room tapping his watch telling them they have three months to finish the game. By the end of its lifespan, Splatoon 2 was a complete polished package, but it was clear that some aspects were definitely rushed at launch to get a Splatoon game on the Switch as soon as possible, and the devs have made it pretty clear that story mode is the last part of the game they work on. So with not a lot of time to make new mechanics, they just kind of started mashing all the old ones together. Now, combining mechanics is not inherently a bad thing. In fact, some of the best parts of a ton of games are when they take all the stuff they already taught you and mix it together in new ways to challenge your skills. But in the case of Splatoon 2, some mechanics are thrown together before you've been taught about any of them. In fact, when replaying Splatoon 2's campaign for this video, I noticed two distinct kinds of levels. Ones that follow the four-step level design we were talking about earlier, and ones that just kind of mash together a bunch of ideas at once. Take for example, level 8, Spinning Campground, also known as the Ink Furler level. This level is pretty good. It starts with a simple demonstration of the mechanic, an Ink Furler platform that extends forward. Ink furlers are actually on a timer, and they roll back up after a few seconds pass. This isn't immediately obvious, so there's a little safety platform underneath, ensuring the player can't die while they're still learning how the mechanic works. The level then goes on to develop this idea, showing the player how they can use it to create platforms to swim on, and how they can crush enemies in a line. It pushes the idea further by spawning in enemies that can force the ink furler back with their own attacks. It twists the idea by introducing vertical ink furlers, expanding the platforming and combat utility of the mechanic. Lastly, it challenges the player with a simultaneous combat and platforming segment that spotlights the mechanic's strengths, ending with a final, explosive hurrah that has the player fighting their way up a long ink furler to the end goal. While this probably isn't anyone's favorite level in the series, its design is, in my opinion, pretty fantastic, and would feel right at home in Splatoon 1. On the other side, we have levels such as number 3, Sunset Octocopter. This is one of the earliest levels in the game, and as such, it should have a lot of new things to teach the player. But how much exactly? Well, the level title implies a focus on Octocopters, Splatoon's basic flying enemy. But we actually start off with a level about dash tracks, these little speed boost platforms that launch you through the air. We then fight some Octocopters, and then we have a ride rail. The first one in the game, by the way. Another dash track with no real challenge added, just a squid ring that's impossible to miss. Now we're platforming and fighting Octocopters again. Alright. Another ride rail, and another dash track. Suddenly, ink pistons. Alright, well now this is what we're doing. Octocopters and ink pistons. This theme continues for a while at least. Some more combat, a trickier jump past some pistons, and oh right, this is a level about dash tracks. So we combine those mechanics, okay cool, and then a new idea with just pistons, and okay another ride rail. A special weapon to kill octocopters in a different way, I suppose. And now we're finally developing the dash track idea, chaining them together and crossing over an actual gap. And then it's the final hurrah, I guess? Once again, combining dash tracks, pistons, and ending off with one last ride rail. So yeah, this level is a little cluttered to say the least. It isn't really bad, and I understand what they're going for. That indeed sequence to show off the synergy of the three mechanics was pretty cool. But I can't help but feel like all three of these mechanics are being shortchanged. In Splatoon 1, each of these would have had its own level, giving the developers the space to experiment and fully explore the potential of each idea. So what happened here? 
Well, we can't say for sure, but my guess is either A, they couldn't think of enough fun ideas to make a full stage out of these mechanics, or B, they didn't have the time and resources to make that many levels. Remember, Splatoon campaigns are pretty short. Splatoon 2 has 27 standard levels, but many of those reuse mechanical themes, and four of them are just stages from the multiplayer filled with a bunch of single-player enemies. Honestly, I think a level about just Dash Tracks and Ink Pistons would have been fine, but the execution here is just not great. Dash Tracks do get used in more interesting ways down the line, such as being placed on walls and sending players straight up. And ride rails do get two entire levels dedicated to them. So how come the first time we see these mechanics, they're mashed together with ink pistons? It just feels messy. And this is far from the only instance. Like I said, most of Splatoon 2's levels can be sorted into four-step levels and mashup levels. Frankly, I think these mashup levels are what bring the campaign down. Constantly shifting the player's focus from one idea to another messes with the level's flow and just makes the game feel worse to play. I want to reiterate that combining mechanics is not a bad thing. Any game with a hint of complexity will ask a player to balance multiple instances of push and pull, but level designs should either teach the player a new idea or challenge them by testing their previous knowledge and expectations. Doing both at the same time results in levels like these that feel like little Timmy throwing mechanics onto his first Mario Maker level. The levels lose focus, and it just becomes a scramble to kill enemies and move forward. Sure, it works, but it takes a huge toll on the pacing of the game, and it's harder to stay engaged. Some of these levels drag on, and you kinda just want them to be over already. This messy design, combined with the fact that there are less brand new mechanics to surprise you, makes the game kind of… boring. There's also another massive issue with the way levels are designed in this game, and it comes back to the whole 9 hero weapons thing. The Splatoon devs really wanted to allow for some player choice, so they let you go back and play every level in the game with all 9 weapons. The thing is, a level designed around the Hero Roller should not play the same as a level designed around the Hero Charger. What happens is, since every level has to be designed with all 9 Hero Weapons in mind, almost no level is designed with any weapon in mind. The level geometry, the enemy placement, the platforming, all of this is completely stunted by the fact that you have to be able to do all of it with an Octobrush, and Dooleys, and Umbrella. This will become especially obvious when we start looking at the next two campaigns, but designing levels for a ton of different weapons actually limits how interesting you can make them. The challenges aren't designed for any specific range or damage output, so you often either feel like complete garbage because you can't reach this stupid switch because this is a splatling level and you're using Dooleys like an idiot, or you feel so overpowered that the game loses its feeling of push and pull and stops being engaging. Splatoon 1 let you get pretty overpowered by upgrading your hero shot, but to balance that, they say, actually, we're just gonna spawn three twinticles right on top of you on an invisible platform level, you'll be fine. Since Splatoon 2 doesn't know how powerful you're going to be, since it doesn't know what weapon you're going to be using, and since every weapon has an upgraded version that can be acquired in any order, it fails to create a proper difficulty curve. It just feels all over the place. Octo Canyon also has two secrets in every level as opposed to one. Along with the return of Sunken Scrolls, there's a hit in Sardinium for every stage. Sardinium is a currency used alongside power eggs to upgrade weapons, which means that it's much more important to collect. While technically optional, the usefulness of the item plus the fact that it's clearly tracked for each level means that a lot of players might end up missing one or more secrets and feel obligated to replay the level. You don't have to replay anything to beat the game, and you can at least use a different weapon on your second go, but I think for a lot of players this probably had some impact on the pacing of their own playthrough, once again making the game feel like a slog to get through. While Octo Canyon technically provides more variety, its slow pacing and less focused design have led many to consider it the worst campaign in the series. It certainly has some glaring flaws, but I do think there are some high points here that are often overlooked. For one, its boss fights are more flashy, exciting, and fun. Unlike the levels, these bosses actually feel tuned for the weapons you're given to fight them with, and while rematches with other weapons are hit or miss, I think there's lots of replayability here that's actually valuable. Unfortunately, the final boss was a pretty big letdown, literally just being an easier version of Splatoon 1's final boss with less attack somehow. The boss also takes place in a static arena rather than having the player chase Octavio through an obstacle course as they fight him. Getting to use the Rainmaker in the final phase was a cool idea, but it just doesn't have the satisfying impact that Splatoon 1's finale delivered so well. In the end, there are a lot of standout levels, and while this campaign reaches lower lows than Splatoon 1 ever did, I think at its best, it's at least as good as the first game, if not sometimes better. To say everything about Octo Cannon is worse than Octo Valley is unfair. It's simply a lack of new mechanics, inconsistency in level theming, and a poorly thought out system for player choice and replayability that brings the campaign down. While these are all very valid criticisms, I still think the game is fun, and it does offer a lot of variety in its content. Perhaps with a bit more time to develop unique ideas, craft a more interesting story, and better balance the difficulty, Splatoon 2 would stand above its predecessor. Unfortunately, as it is now, despite its attempts to increase production value and scope through experimentation, I think Octo Canyon falls short of the polished experience provided by the first game. Huh.
Wonder how that'll go next time. March 8th, 2018. The day the Splatoon community changed forever. We were hit with a back-to-back -back reveal of playable Octolings in a brand new single-player campaign, and Inkling being the first newcomer to Smash Bros. on Nintendo Switch. We were going insane. <laughs> this is still easily my favorite Nintendo Direct of all time, and probably the most hyped I ever was as a Nintendo fan. But did Octo Expansion live up to all this excitement? <laughs> Yes, Octo Expansion was incredible. Contrasting Octo Canyon, it is considered by many to still be the peak of Splatoon single player. Well, what made it so great? First, it dared to be different. It ditched most of the formula of the previous campaigns and introduced a streamlined level select menu with short, diverse challenges rather than longer stages. Most missions now featured a unique clear condition. Rather than just get to the end, you might have to break a number of crates, or clear out a ton of enemies, or do whatever weird thing the game decides to throw your way. What we see here is a deviation from our best friend four-step level design, but in this case, it works. In a lot of these missions, the entire objective is laid out before you, and your job is just to tackle it with enough speed, precision, or skill to survive. Octo Expansion doesn't spend a lot of time teaching you mechanics, because it expects you to know them already. It had the advantage of being an expansion. Most players will have already seen Octo Canyon, so they don't need to waste your time with tutorials. The trade-off is that this is the hardest campaign by far. Depending on who you are, that could be a good or bad thing. As a Splatoon veteran myself, I loved the extra challenge, and got much more of a thrill out of beating stages that gave me a hard time than I ever did waltzing through easier stages in past games. But that did create a bit of a problem. This is paid DLC, so there's a bit of an expectation that you're aware of what you're getting into when you buy it. All the same, the developers didn't want to leave less experienced players struggling forever, so they added a skip button that charges up after a few losses. I'm always a little iffy on the option to outright not play a part of the game, but I I do think this is a better outcome than leaving a player frustrated and upset. Skipping a level allows you to continue progressing normally down the subway line beyond the station you've skipped. The only downside is that you are not awarded the stage's memcake poem, which I think is a fair enough trade-off, and I like that it at least gives the player an incentive to return. It should also be noted that Octolings do not become playable characters in multiplayer until you finish Octo Expansion, and the developers stated that they didn't want to upset players who simply wanted to play as an Octoling online. The skip charge prevents these players from being locked out of that experience while still encouraging them to at least give it a go. Let's say you don't skip any levels. What are you getting yourself into? Well, to start, Octo Expansion excels in all the places Octo Canyon fell short. The introduction of unique clear conditions did so much for the pacing of the game and allowed the developers to go crazy with different ideas. There are only a handful of actual brand new mechanics introduced here, but the new format allowed for levels that forced players to approach existing mechanics in entirely new ways. And the mechanics that were new were completely different from anything the series had seen before, one of the most notable being the 8-ball, literally a spherical physics object that has to be pushed throughout the level as you navigate it yourself. If you fall, you die. If it falls, you die. Protect it from enemy fire, roll it to the end, and you win. A simple idea executed wonderfully. The reason I bring up these levels specifically is because they were the first example of Splatoon intentionally slowing down its pacing and designing stages less as obstacle courses and more as puzzles, encouraging players to play more carefully and methodically rather than rushing through guns blazing. Speaking of guns, Octo Expansion solved the weapon issue. Instead of unlocking one weapon for each class over time, every station has its own unique selections of weapons from the game's multiplayer. Some levels only have one option, some have two, and some have three, with varying rewards based on which weapon the game considers more difficult to play in the given mission. This is pretty much the perfect solution to Octo Canyon's dilemma. No longer are you limited to nine weapons, nearly every weapon from the multiplayer appears at some point in this campaign. And more importantly, with this change, every stage can be tailored to just a few weapon options, meaning challenges can be much more tightly designed and take full advantage of the abilities unique to those weapons. This leads to a lot of really interesting missions that push the weapons to their limits, like this level where you have to run over crates with a brush while tightly managing your ink tank, or this level where you have to use the goo tuber's extra long store charge to land a mid-air snipe on a grappling. It isn't just that there's more variety than before, there's an increased level of polish to every part of this campaign, and it really makes a difference. You have a decent amount of choice considering the order you tackle these missions as well. You are required to collect the four things, which are placed roughly equidistant across the whole map, but out of 80 missions, you're only required to complete about 24. The game
game still manages to create a difficulty curve though due to the linear nature of the subway lines. Simply put the harder levels further away from the start and near the things. But if a mission is really giving you trouble, forget the actual skip button, you can probably just go around it. It should be mentioned that these levels no longer contain collectible secrets. Instead, you are rewarded with a mem cake simply for clearing the stage, which is a fun little eraser thing complete with a poem from Agent 8's perspective, both serving the world building and characterizing the player octoling. Neat. Plus, as you complete stages, you'll slowly unlock the chat log, once again aiding the world building and providing a space for the other characters to shine. But is something lost by giving these away for simple completion rather than secret hunting? I would argue, not really. There are still secrets in the missions, only in the form of power egg packs rather than a unique collectible. These are 100% just to reward players for being nosy, and are not required or tracked by the game in any way. I honestly think this is the right route to go for secrets in Splatoon. After the other campaigns, it's oddly relieving to just be able to focus on the mechanics of the level without worrying in the back of your mind that you've missed a collectible and crossed a point of no return. And these secrets sometimes make you feel extra special for being more dedicated than the average player, sometimes even triggering hidden dialogue to congratulate you. I'm a big fan of this change. Every stage in Octo Expansion feels different from the last, and by the time it runs out of new ideas, it's over. However, there are a few levels here and there that don't feel quite as exciting as the rest, and there are a few rough cases of repurposed assets like these Tower Control and Raymaker levels that kinda just turn into a mess. One of the worst parts of Octo Expansion is that it reuses boss fights from Octo Canyon. While I praised these bosses earlier as being innovative and fun, I just don't feel like these new fights add much to their design. My favorite rematches are against the Octo Oven, the first Splatoon boss that can actually paint the floor better than the player, and the Octo Shower, simply because you get to fight it with the Inkjet, which actually probably makes it easier for a lot of players. The Octo Stomp Redux just drags on for too long in my opinion, and the Octo Samurai can feel downright unfair, taking an obnoxious amount of attacks to kill while being able to one-shot you if you aren't careful. These bosses aren't too much of a letdown, and the game doesn't even tie them to story progression, so it's not really a big deal. You can literally does not fight them, but since they aren't even fully original to this campaign, I would argue they're one of the weakest parts of the game. The other thing that Octo Expansion is missing is an open-ended hub area. But honestly, does it need it? I enjoyed the hubs to a certain extent in the past games, especially in Splatoon 1, but it's hard to say if it would have added much here. In Octo Valley and Canyon, I think the hubs are great for establishing the story's setting, making it clear that everything is taking place far outside of Inkopolis. But Octo Expansion achieves this very well through its introduction sequence and through repeat visits to Deep Sea Central Station after collecting each thing. The CQ80 menu is a streamlined level select, but it still feels very much like a part of the game world. The first two games also use the hubs to break up the pacing a bit, but as we discussed, Octo Expansion handles this just fine, mixing in some more puzzly missions between the action-packed ones. In reality, I imagine creating a hub world was simply outside of the development scope. This is just a DLC expansion after all. But honestly, I think Octo Expansion is better off for it. There's no bloat here, it's just level after level after level. And it's not like the subway car doesn't have its own charm. A few characters you can talk to, cool backgrounds, and a rotating cast of NPCs depending on which line you're currently riding. Really, there's a lot going on here considering how small of a space this is, and I think it does its job perfectly. After exploring enough of the subway system and collecting the four things, you'll unlock the chance to escape to the promised land. And the escape sequence that follows... Oh, I, I love the escape sequence. Ignoring the story beats for now, again, I'll talk about that in another video, the way this campaign ends is brilliant. A climactic series of eight stages, structured like Wily Castle from the end of a Mega Man game, where Octo Expansion can show off all of its best ideas for one final hurrah. A stealth mission, followed by some tricky ink rail jumps to earn your weapon back, followed by the ultimate shoot and swim platforming section, followed by mission impossible laser dodging, followed by the final test of your inkjet abilities, followed by multitasking basically every enemy at the same time, followed by easily the coolest story moment ever in a Splatoon game, followed by what? 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 This is without a doubt my favorite segment of Splatoon gameplay to ever exist. The story has built up tension and mystery, the game has abandoned the level structure it's been using this entire time, instead going further and further, increasing in scope and difficulty with every stage as you climb higher and higher. The characters are cheering you on, you are Agent 8, and this is your ascension to the surface. There's nothing left to do but fight and climb your way to the end. It's the ultimate test of your competence as a player, of your knowledge of the mechanics that have been presented to you, and it all culminates into this powerful, satisfying gameplay experience. The final boss, well, not exactly a fight, serves as one more evaluation of your mechanical skill, and a perfect thematic conclusion to the story and aesthetic of the campaign. Pearl and Marina are the first and only idols to actually physically do something, Agent 8 and Agent 3 look at each other, which is enough for the community to deem them madly in love, Cuttlefish is no longer racist, credits roll. 8 out of 8, masterpiece. How could they ever top that? Yeah, they didn't.
Splatoon 3's return of the Mammalians is a mixed bag. There's some good, some bad, some okay parts. Let's just take a look at the start. So Splatoon 3 starts off slow, and not really for the same reasons Octo Canyon did. This campaign attempts to fuse the design philosophies of the first two hero modes with Octo Expansion, leading to, as I said, mixed results. Similar to the first two games, you traverse a hub area to find kettles, but like Octo Expansion, missions are short and sweet. For the start of the game, this means a long, awkward tutorial broken up into four parts for no good reason. Former Captain Cuttlefish talks to you after every kettle too, which is honestly just kind of annoying. I love Splatoon's characters, but this is not the time to be dropping hero suit lore, we've barely gotten a chance to fight enemies at this point. And then things start to get a little interesting. The Squid Sisters and Octavio make early appearances, the latter being really cool as we're essentially fighting the final boss of the last two games as the first boss of this one. This version of Octavio is honestly more fun than Splatoon 2's, and the fact that he fits in just fine at this point in the game just goes to show how easy the final boss of Octo Canyon was. The fight even makes use of Small Fry, the new agent's salmonid friend that acts as a second silent protagonist and a new gameplay mechanic. I think this is a fantastic introductory boss, and it does a lot to distinguish this campaign from the past games. In fact, it actually feels like they're poking fun at how repetitive the past stories were. And then, the fall. Literally, but also metaphorically. The new Agent 3 and Small Fry land in Alterna, a lost civilization that once acted as the final stand for the dying human race. Sounds pretty cool, and when looking at the narrative and lore, it really is. Unfortunately, today we're looking at the gameplay, and Alterna... Eh. It's the biggest hub of any Splatoon game, with arguably the best presentation, but navigating it is a different story. It's all about this mechanic known as Fuzzy Ooze, a substance that covers the landscape, acting as a blockade and causing instant death upon contact. To beat the game, you need to defeat the three bosses of Alterna, which are placed on three of the six sites. The point of Fuzzy Ooze is to stop you from getting there. The only way to clear it out is by getting enough power eggs, which are rewarded to you in bulk for clearing levels. Alright, so that's your gameplay loop. Beat levels, get eggs, and clear out the ooze. It makes sense, and I understand what the intention was here. Rather than requiring players to beat every kettle on every island, the game allows you to carve out your own path to the boss kettle, which can be opened as soon as you reach it. But the way Fuzzy Ooze was implemented leads to some issues. Let me explain what I mean. When I was exploring Site 3 on my first playthrough, I came across this balloon challenge on the frozen lake. To complete the challenge, you have to pop several groups of balloons under a strict time limit before they float away. This one in particular features a bunch of dash tracks you can use to zip around, taking advantage of the slippery ice physics. Now, at this point, there was still a ton of fuzzy ooze around the lake. I tried a couple of times, but kept either running straight into the ooze and getting fuzzed, or not quite making it in time to pop every balloon. The thing is, I could have just gone and cleared out some of the ooze. I had plenty of power eggs and the fuzzball was right there. But I continued to attempt it as it was. I learned that you could halt your momentum from the ice by jumping backwards and shooting. I realized I could optimize the challenge by throwing small fry at one balloon while I shot at the others. A few attempts later, and I completed it. This may seem inconsequential at first, but this was essentially the only instance in the entire game where I could choose to leave the fuzzy ooze there to intentionally give myself a challenge. In most areas, Fuzzy Ooze is simply a blockade, and its destruction is mandatory. Every other balloon challenge requires you to clear out some of the ooze. So what's wrong with that? Well, the problem is, clearing out the ooze isn't fun. There's no enticing gameplay element here, it's just point and press the button. And if the Fuzzy Ooze doesn't pose a threat, what's the point of having these hub areas? Enemies never spawn here, and there's hardly any real platforming to speak of. Clearing out the ooze on a site removes pretty much all of the danger. After it's gone, what's the point? It's just a straight walk to each kettle. You may be thinking that that sounds pretty similar to the hubs of Splatoon 1 and 2, and while that's not entirely wrong, those games actually had small challenges or platforming segments built into the environment itself. Earlier I called Sector 5 of Octo Canyon tedious, and while I do think they probably went overboard there, at least the hub felt like it served a purpose and was a part of the gameplay. Okay, well I kinda lied. There isn't nothing to the sites once the ooze is gone. Like Octo Expansion, there are no longer collectibles to find in the missions, so they're here instead. Some lore is revealed to you simply for clearing kettles, but scrolls, sardinium, decoration items, table turf card packs, and sometimes bonus power eggs are found in the overworld. Some of these are just lying around in crates, while most are hidden in loot anchors, buried underground. You you find them by shooting at these little red lights, or by throwing small fry to track completely invisible ones. Alright, so what's going on here? Well, remember what we talked about earlier. What does a game need for it to be fun? In most cases, there has to be an objective, and there has to be an obstacle. There is a reward that can only be earned through a certain amount of risk, and in most cases, the game's fun comes from the necessity to confront the risk in order to get the reward. Now, let's take a look back at Fuzzy Ooze and Loot Anchors. You might already see what my point is here. Almost half of Return of the Mammalians is basically spent shooting the floor. And for doing this, you get rewards, but with no risk. So there's no strategy. 
Even worse, there's no fun. The reason I didn't clear out the Fuzzy Ooze when I first played the Site 3 Balloon Challenge is because I wanted a risk. I wanted to strategize. I wanted to have fun. Unfortunately, there are only a handful of situations where Fuzzy Ooze is actually used as an obstacle that you can strategize around. There's this one section of Site 5 where you can jump across these fences, there's the Zipcaster section of the Spirit Lifter, the penultimate stage of the game, and maybe a few other places around Alterna, but that's it. The vast majority of the time, there is no way for the player to interact with the Ooze other than deleting it from the game. I think Fuzzy Ooze had the potential to make exploration around these sites much more interesting, but it ends up just serving the purpose of temporarily bar progression and not much else. You basically spend half of this game opening locked doors. I don't know if Fuzzy Ooze bothered other people as much as me, but it pretty heavily tainted my opinion of Return of the Mammalians. Not only was it a disappointing mechanic, it's one that's constantly in your way, literally, slowing down the pacing of the game for no good reason. In another game with lower stakes across the board, it might have fit in better, but in Splatoon, which typically has a great sense of push and pull, these elements felt odd and underwhelming. Alright, but what about the actual kettles? Let's start with the good, because there are some fantastic levels here. Avoiding the Octo Stamp Shockwaves, the crab level where you shoot this weird robot made of crates, the level where you dodge obstacles while riding Octo Zeppelins, a sequel to the Floor's Lava level from Octo Expansion, all three of the Zipcaster levels, and plenty more were really well designed and really did feel fresh and exciting. Unfortunately, somewhat like Octo Canyon, I feel like there just weren't enough new ideas to adequately fill this many kettles. So many missions in this campaign are just forgettable. So many of them just have you kill enemies and make your way to the end, which isn't necessarily bad, again, thanks to Splatoon's fundamental game essence, but after the incredible variety and quality of execution seen in Octo Expansion, I guess I just expected a little more. It's difficult to judge the quality of these levels in a completely objective sense, because if this is your first Splatoon game, everything here is new and exciting. But for me, I look at this and say, really? A level that's just about propeller lifts? We had two of those in 2015, seven years before this campaign came out. You would think that with this amount of player choice when it comes to which levels to do and how to do them, they would be willing to take more risks. Two of my favorite stages in the whole game were these ones about a new mechanic called Soaker Blocks. Shooting them makes them expand and multiply along a predetermined path, similar to snake blocks from Mario. They're used in a bunch of interesting platforming and combat encounters, and once they serve their purpose, you only see a few more for the rest of the whole campaign. These kettles remind me of Splatoon 1 levels, albeit shorter, and how they introduce a mechanic, develop it, twist it, test your skills, then get out of your way. I just wish there were more levels like these throughout Alterna. I have to say I'm a little disappointed by how underutilized Small Fry ended up being too. There's like one kettle in the first site that has some cool uses for him, and there's the first rocket stage where you don't have a weapon so you have to use him to get around, and I guess his main purpose was just eating ooze and digging up items, but in the levels he's functionally just a bomb. Like in the tutorial, they tell you to throw him at a faraway crate, but once you have a bomb unlocked, why would you ever use small fry instead? He's literally just slower than a bomb. The guy's job was taken over by technology before he even got here. Really quickly, I should mention that Return of the Mammalian's upgrade system uses a skill tree rather than just a list of options, which while serving as a good incentive to find secrets in the hub areas, ends up hurting the campaign as well, as it takes much longer to get useful combat and utility sub-weapons that improve the game feel dramatically. So yeah, it may seem like I'm being really harsh on Return of the Mammalians. Trust me, no one wishes I could love this campaign more than me, but the reality is, this is the hero mode with the least new ideas of any campaign campaign so far, and the ideas that are new are very hit or miss, often feeling like they fell short of their true potential. The game makes a lot of the same mistakes that Splatoon 2 made. Slow start, reused assets and systems from previous games, tedious hub world, bad pacing, and a lack of original ideas to keep it feeling fresh the whole way through. Some levels are extremely polished and unique, while others just don't quite meet the standard of quality that past campaigns maintained. To finish off, let's talk about the bosses and the rocket sequence. In Alterna, you fight Fry, Shiver, and Big Man. It was definitely a surprise to battle the idols of all people, or it would have been a surprise if I wasn't spoiled, and their fights are pretty cool, if a little simple. I think Shiver is probably the best boss in the whole game, while Fry is just a little too basic for my liking, and Big Man is just way too easy if you have the sensor or the hero shot upgraded, but overall, they're pretty good. The grand finale follows in Octo Expansion's footsteps with a Wily Castle sequence, featuring just five segments this time. While Octo Expansion's ending completely blew me away, the rocket levels are just fine. The first part is kinda cool because they take your gear away, but not as cool as the stealth section was. The hangar is alright, it's fun to use all the specials, but there isn't really any challenge here. The auto-scroller part just kinda sucks, honestly, and the spirit lifter is a little too repetitive for my liking. The Zipcaster section is definitely supposed to be this game's equivalent of the diaphragm phase from Octo Expansion, and I definitely think this is the best part of the sequence. Pretty cool. And the final boss. I have a lot of things to say about Mr. Grizz's reveal in my video about the story, but for now let's just say 
This boss is alright. I like that it forces you to move quickly, do some platforming, and deal with a lot of the enemies you face so far. The constant camera cuts to show Grizz dissolving are kind of annoying, and this 4 minute cutscene in the middle of the fight goes on way too long. The final phase is okay, I like that you have to frantically pop in and out of the cockpit to fend off enemies, but the actual vacuuming part is trivial, and despite the spectacle, for me it still just didn't manage to feel as climactic as Splatoon 1 Octavio or Octo Expansion's Commander Tardart. Ultimately, this may actually be my least favorite Splatoon campaign. I know that might be an unpopular opinion, but it's difficult to get over the fact that I hate like 40% of the gameplay. Octo Expansion's short and sweet missions worked because of the streamlined menu to hop between them, but in Alterna, most levels felt too short, many of them felt disappointing, and due to the hub world design, the pacing between them felt abysmal. I hate to end off this video on such a sour note, and I do have conflicted feelings about Return of the Mammalians. There is some fantastic design in this campaign, but it fails to consistently surprise and entertain me as much as past campaigns did, and it's bloated with poor choices that make getting to the best parts so much harder. It's clear that Splatoon has come a long way. The presentation, scope, and density of content has gone through major developments in the seven years of the series' history. The formula has been tweaked, overhauled, and returned to form, and it's not exactly clear where it might be going next. I once mentioned in an older video of mine that Splatoon faces a difficult and unique problem for Nintendo. Because the core movement and combat mechanics hail from the game's multiplayer, the developers don't have the freedom to make major changes to gameplay physics or player abilities, lest they scare off fans of the series or make something that feels too detached from the game's multiplayer core. They are limited by the smaller scope of what is considered a secondary mode, and certain mechanics such as special weapons are restrained in their functionality by multiplayer balance should they be kept consistent between the two parts of the game. Despite that, Nintendo has continued to surprise us with engaging, unique gameplay in all four of Splatoon's campaigns. There have been ups and downs, and while I was personally disappointed with Splatoon 3 showing, all of these games are great in their own right. I think Splatoon 1's Octo Valley and Splatoon 2's Octo Expansion are the best examples of Splatoon's ability to spawn unique ideas that each serve as pieces of a larger picture. They are both definitively Splatoon in my mind, and I'm in awe of how much they managed to accomplish despite their limitations. Octo Canyon and Return of the Mammalians, while still featuring some fantastic moments and innovative gameplay, failed to engage me in the same way due to inconsistency in level design and questionable decisions that hinder overall pacing and moment-to-moment -moment flow state. So what's the point of this video? Well, for me, analyzing, praising, and criticizing these games is all a part of the fun, and I'm not a game designer, so don't take anything I say too seriously. Really, it just wasn't enough for me to say I don't like Splatoon 3's campaign. I had to know why I didn't like it, and that's basically what pushed me to make this video. I've realized that when it comes to the games I love, I don't just enjoy playing them, but actually breaking them down and looking behind the scenes in order to find out what it is that makes them so enticing. In this process, I tend to learn more about them, about their creators, and about myself. So hopefully, if you're still here, you enjoyed it too. This is by no means a definitive list of the pros and cons of all four games, but I found it to be a really fun exercise, and I feel like I got a lot out of it. What's fun to one person, though, is not the same for everyone else, so as always, feel free to share your own thoughts in the comments. At the time of recording, Splatoon 3's expansion, named Side Order, has been revealed, but we know next to nothing about it. I'm very interested to see where they take the series next, and I'm still very much looking forward to it despite, or maybe even because of how much I didn't like Return of the Mammalians. Basically, I'm very ready for a new campaign to be obsessed with. But until then, that's all we have to talk about, so thanks for watching. This has been Cosmic. Farewell.